Welcome to another great episode right here on IT Pro TV. You're watching the CompTIA IT Fundamentals. I'm your host, Ronnie Wong, and today we're in a part two on configuring a wireless router. That means we've already gotten at least the connection that we need and that we know that we can get access into the configuration page. But now to help us set that up is going to be Mr. Don Pizet. Don, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me back, Ronnie. And you know, we have a laundry list of chores <laughs> to do in this episode. Uh, in part one, we got well, you know, we plugged the router in, which was exciting, phenomenal <laughs> uh, activity there. Uh, and we managed to get to the administration web page, right? And, and we've verified that technically it is up and running. We, we've got a wireless network. We've got all that. The only problem was by the end of the episode, all that stuff was done, but it was all at the default values. And unfortunately, if we stopped right there, we would actually be stopping in the same place as many people throughout the world. Right. And our system would be extremely vulnerable to attack and, uh, and misuse. So we need to get in here and tweak some of these default settings, change them to ways that allow us to browse the web safely, securely, and with the highest performance possible. So that's all stuff that we're going to look at right here in this episode. All right. So Don, we've talked about some of the different configurations that we need to go through uh, right, right before the show began. But uh, where do we want to start here? And does the order matter in terms of the way that we start? So if... If you're in the middle of nowhere and you're the only person configuring, then the order really doesn't matter. You can configure however you want. But for me, and, and for most people, you're probably configuring this in an office building, in a apartment complex, or you have neighbors nearby, and all of a sudden the order does matter. Because the moment a wireless network pops up, there's plenty of people that are out there saying, oh, I want free internet. Here's this one. Let me try this wireless network. And everybody has some kind of wireless device. So for me, Job number one is securing the router so someone else can't take it over, right? And that, that sounds weird. If somebody else were to join this wireless network net right now, it is a default administrative password that is the word admin. I know it. You know it from watching this show. And tens of thousands of network administrators across the U.S. and across the globe all know it as well. Any one of them could try that as a default password and try and get in. So to me, that's job number one. That's always the first thing I do. I just got into this router. Let me go change the admin password. If I were to stop there, just change the admin password, an attacker could still get on my wireless network, right? They could use my internet, but they couldn't take over the router. And from there, I can start to make other configuration changes and get things tightened up. So that's, that's mission number one for me is change that admin password. Now, when you go into your router, you'll likely see a summary screen like I'm seeing here. And the summary screen is great because it lets you know whether the connections are working and so on. Most of them will have links on the left side that say something like basic setup and advanced setup. And changing the administration password is typically under the basic setup. On this particular router, it's actually in a different spot. It's down under connectivity. In fact, the majority of the settings I want to configure are all under this connectivity menu. So it may not be um, you know, something that you just kind of stumble through and figure out. Like I might not think, oh, admin password, that's under connectivity. It's, it's weird. Uh, and that's where having the user manual for your router comes in really handy. All right, so I'm going to go under connectivity. And what we're going to see here are things that Linksys considers the bare minimum to get your router configured. But a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about is all right here on this one page even uh, where I can go jump in and set that up. The admin password is down here at the bottom. So it's telling me I can set a router password. And right now it is uh, apparently eight stars. Uh, well, <laughs> it's not eight stars. It's just obscuring what's actually typed in there. I can change that password. And so I'm going to choose edit, and I'm going to set that to a different password. Now, you can make this an easy password, a hard password. You can make it complex. The key thing here is that, one, you're the only one who knows it, and two, you don't forget it, right? Because if you forget the password, you won't be able to get in here anymore. And your only option at that point will be to reset the router. If you reset the router, you lose all your settings. You can still use the router, though. You can never truly lock yourself out of a router. You'll be able to get back in there. You might just lose your configuration after redo that, right? Not, not the end of the world. So I'm going to type in a password, and I'm going to use Ronnie's standard password. Uh, <laughs> and as you're typing it in, notice how this one doesn't ask me to verify the password. So if I make a typo here, I could be about to lock myself out. Fortunately, they give me the little eyeball so I can see what I typed and make sure that it's actually typed the way that I want. You want to make sure nobody's staring over your shoulder <laughs> while you view that. It's, if you're in your own home, you're fine. And then you can set a password hint. And so I'll set mine to Ronnie's password so that I can remember it. Uh, if I was using a Linksys smart Wi-Fi account, it's tied to your email address. So you can always do a password reset with your email. 
But here, this is just on the router itself. There's no way for me to reset the password other than factory resetting the device. Now, on most routers, when you make a change like that and you close the window, you might think that that change has taken effect. But these routers, they have the bare minimum hardware in them possible to do the job. That's why they're so inexpensive. They're computers. They have a processor, memory, storage, motherboard, all of that. But they're cheap because they have very little memory, like the bare minimum. So when you make configuration changes like these, they typically don't take effect right away. You need to look on screen for a couple of buttons, and mine are down here towards the bottom, where it says, OK, cancel, apply. If I say cancel, it's going to throw away that password I just put in. If I say OK, it's going to apply the password and close this window. If I hit apply, it's going to apply the password, and it's not going to close this window. So if I'm going to continue doing work in here, I'll want to just hit apply, and that way the password takes effect, and I stay in this screen, and I can keep doing work. So look for those. If you bought a really cheap router, right? Like let's say it's a one that's under $50. When you hit apply, it'll likely reboot. And that's because they only load, the really inexpensive ones only load their configuration at boot time. And so it'll reboot. So every little change you make might be a 30 second delay in between each one. Super frustrating, but just be aware that does happen. Uh, this is actually a pretty nice router. I believe it cost around $150 or $200. So it's kind of on the higher end of home routers. And, uh, and so it, it just applies right away. But that is a different behavior you might experience out there. Is there another type of password that we ought, must, might also need to think about configuring? Uh, you know, there are some other things. Now, I, I was lucky. Uh, I shouldn't say luck because I kind of planned it. Uh, that when I plugged in my internet connection, it just started working, right? And if you have fiber internet or cable broadband internet, uh, if you have Metro Ethernet or something like that, the odds are you just plug it in and it works. Right? But if you have DSL, a lot of DSL connections don't just work. When you plug them in, there's a little bit more to it. Some of them require an internet password. You have a user account with that provider. So if I get AT&T DSL, I have to log in with my AT&T account to make it work. I can plug in the DSL connection. It'll make the light light up, but I won't be able to send any data over it until I log in. If your connection requires that, then it'll be over here under internet settings. If you go under internet settings, see how mine just says automatic configuration DHCP. That's what most of us are going to use. If you're cable, fiber, Metro Ethernet, they all are just going to be auto configured DHCP and that's it. On many DSL connections, it's going to be the same. That's why this is the default. It works for the most people. But if I edit that, you'll see it creates a drop down box. And one of the options in there is PPPOE. That's the point-to-point -point protocol over Ethernet. And a lot of DSL systems will use that, or you'll actually see another entry in there, um, this one just calls it PPPOE, where it actually says like PPPO DSL or PPPOA, which is PPP over analog. Um, they, you know, there's a couple of different names, but it's all basically the same thing. It's saying, look, you're gonna connect to this system, but you're gonna provide a username and a password as well. And so I would put in my AT&T account, which I don't have, but you know, whatever, uh, uh, whatever that account is, and then whatever that password is. And once I've got that in place, I'll save that. And now it's going to send that username and password to AT&T, and they'll authorize me relaying data through that connection. So you may have to configure that. I, I don't in my scenario. Most people don't. Uh, and so we stick with automatic DHCP. All right. There's a lot of other modes in there that vary based on router. If you want to learn more about those, and the Network Plus series really go into depth on those. But, uh, but here in uh, IT Fundamentals, it's usually just going to be DHCP or PPPoE. Those are kind of the two. Now, technically, I didn't change anything on this screen, right? But I like to hit Cancel down at the bottom just to be on the save side to make sure that I don't save the changes that I made. I hit Apply earlier when I changed the password. So if I hit Cancel now, it'll close that window and undo any change that I made. Uh, that I hadn't already applied. So I'll just use cancel to do that. All right, so Don, now that we've actually got that, uh, that part uh, and those two passwords, you already shown us a wireless network uh, that's been existing out there. And you said we need to change the name for that and, oh, sure. uh, and also secure it too. All right, yep. So right now it's already got wireless up and running. And I can see that right here on the connectivity screen. I've got a 2.4 gigahertz and a 5 gigahertz network, all right? Um, what's the difference? 
the gigahertz, yeah. right? So, so 2.4 gigahertz is uh, considered a high frequency RF communication. Um, it's used by several different standards. Uh, we, we talked about these in an earlier episode. 802.11, A, B, G, and, well, actually, wait a minute. Um, yeah. B uses not 2.4. Oh, it is 2.4. Okay. Is. So, uh, oh, and A is 5 gigahertz. Well, anyhow, different standards <laughs> use different frequencies. 5 gigahertz is faster, so it can move more data, but it's got a shorter range. And 2.4 gigahertz is slower, but it's got a longer range. So depending on where you are in your home, you might connect on one frequency or another. Most devices these days support both. You might have older devices that only support 2.4, or you might have something that's locked into 5, uh, but usually it's just about you know, signal strength is what it comes down to. So I see these two different networks, and see how Linksys has given them different names? They don't have to have different names. You can change that. But the default name is pretty generic. Linksys 06209. An attacker is going to see that and say, oh, here's somebody who doesn't know how to change the default. That's a network I want to connect to and try and guess the default password. Well, fortunately, they gave me a default password here that's fairly complex, so nobody's going to guess that, right? Unless that's the default password they use on all Linksys routers. I, I don't know. Maybe it is, right? So I'm going to want to get in there and change those to values that I know, and then I can choose who I want to share that with. So I can hit edit up here, and I can come in and I can change the name. Now, the 2.4 and the 5 gigahertz networks, they don't have to have different names. You can give them the same name. If you want people to be able to automatically switch between one and another, if you give them the same name and same password, most systems will be able to do that. If they're a different name and password, people will have to pick. Do they want to go 2.4 or do they want to go 5? And maybe you want that, right? Maybe you've got a... Uh, uh, one of those little boxes on your TV that's doing Netflix, and you're wanting to do the Ultra HD on a 4K, right? And it's over wireless. So you want it to be on the 5 gigahertz because it's faster, and you know it's nearby to the router. But then for your cell phone, you want to be able to roam all over the house, and you're not really worried about it being super fast, so you might want it to be on the 2.4. If you give them separate names, it makes it easier to pick which one you're connecting to, okay? So I might come in here and call this, like, uh, Don's Wi-Fi... 2.4. Actually, I don't remember if it'll let me do a period or not. Well, you know what? We'll try. Uh, and then the other one, I might choose to rename that Don's Wi-Fi uh, 5. Or you know what? I might I might call it fast and slow or something like that. You know, whatever, whatever it is that you want to call it, it's up to you. Um, you can actually do a lot of things in the name. I mentioned that I might not be able to do a period. I can't remember if I can do a period or not. You can do spaces. Uh, you can, in fact, uh, just looking at some of the wireless networks in our own building up here, which I've, I've turned my Wi-Fi off, so let me turn that back on. Uh, but if you look at some of the Wi-Fi networks here in our own building, like Gainesville Dev Academy, it's a pretty long name. Whoops. <laughs> it's a pretty long name, and it's got spaces in it. IT Pro TV Guest has a hyphen in it. You'll see JR companies where they've actually got that 5 gigahertz one showing up. Uh, so it, it's kind of up to you what you want to put in that name. You just want to make it where it's recognizable so that you'll, you'll know which is which. So uh, so you can name those. And then the password. The passwords can be the same. They can be different. That's up to you. Uh, so I might make my password 123. Probably not the best password to use. But I'll go ahead and punch that in there. So now when somebody wants to get on my network, I can share that password with them. And it's not the default password. It's not what uh, Linksys set or Netgear set or whatever. It's one that I set the way that I want it. So I'm going to get that put in place. And I'm going to come down here and hit Apply. And it's giving me a warning here that I'm about to change my network. Now, why is it giving me a warning when it didn't before? Well, this is the first change I've made that could potentially disconnect me from the router. If I'm connected to the wireless network already, and that's how I'm configuring it, what's going to happen when the name changes? I'm going to get disconnected. So it's reminding me of what those settings should be, right? And just letting me know it's, it's what I chose. So I'll just say yes to that, and it's going to take effect. Now it says your router is applying changes it might have to reboot. In my case, I don't think it actually reboots because it's a little too fast. I think it's just turning the antennas off and turning them back on, but many routers will reboot at this point. So it could take 30 seconds before that takes effect. How do I know it works? Well, I can watch the lights on the front of the router, I suppose. Uh, eventually, this web page will refresh. Right now, the web page is kind of stuck. I can also go back out here and just watch for the wireless networks, right? Eventually, these Linksys ones will go away and there's Don's Wi-Fi Fast showing up, right? So there's those new networks popping up. And I could even try and connect. So if I connect to that network, it's going to prompt me for the password. And I'll punch in password. Whoops. I will try and type password123. And make sure I type that right. 
Uh, and then I'm gonna go ahead and join it. And once I get connected, I'll see my little wireless symbol up here go solid, assuming that it works. And then I'll know that I'm connected. There we go. And so now I'm on it. And I only saw Don's Wi-Fi fast a moment ago. Now I see Don's Wi-Fi slow is showing up. And the other old Linksys networks, they've disappeared, right? So I know my change took effect. I'm able to connect. And if I jump back over here to the router, there we go. Now my user interface is moving again. It finished that reset and I'm back in business. So now I've got a different admin password and I've reconfigured my Wi-Fi to use my own name and password that I wanted to use. And now I've got a device that I don't have to worry about strangers jumping on or attackers taking over. We're in a pretty good spot. All right, Don. Now, uh, as we have actually now seen that we've got everything fairly secured, you had mentioned in the previous episode that we might also, in our initial configuration, have to think about the firmware updates. How important is this? All right, so this is also pretty important. I mentioned that we're in pretty good shape here. Attackers can't compromise my router. Well, they can't if they're doing things the normal way, right? But hackers don't do things the normal way. They always try and find flaws, weaknesses, vulnerabilities in our hardware, some way to be able to get in, right? And that happens. There's bugs in some routers, the little problems, and the hackers figure those out, and then they're able to get in. And we need to be able to protect from that. Also, sometimes there's just other general issues, like maybe a new law comes out, the FCC passes some statute, and all of a sudden, um, you know, the, the router manufacturers have to change some setting on the router. And so they will frequently push out updates, firmware updates or software updates that either fix problems or improve the security of your router. And the reason I mentioned it in the last episode was back here on my homepage, there's this little status window here that's showing me that I am connected to the internet. And it's alternating between two pages. The second page is telling me there's a firmware update available, right? It's telling me there's something new for this router and I can click here to learn more. And if I click over here, it's checking or a firmware update. And it's telling me there is a new firmware. Right now it's available, I could install it if I wanted. I'm running 2.0.1.182461, and now there's a 2.0.2.188405. <laughs> yeah, some long version of this. Um, so really it's going from 2.01 to 2.02. The first two, that's a major version. It'd be a big deal if we were going to three point something. Then you have a minor version. Right? If we were going from 2.0 to 2.1, that's usually like adding features. But this is 2.0.1 point something. That is a, considered a subversion. And subversions are normally bug fixes and security fixes. And these are important. A bug fix will make sure the router is working most of the time, that it's not like rebooting randomly or dropping connection when it shouldn't be. Security fixes are fixing little backdoors or flaws that attackers have found to keep your device secure. Now, I'll be honest with you, most people can figure a router, turn it on, and never look at it again as long as it works. Maybe they reboot it once in a while. They never do firmware updates. Many, many people are running routers that are two years old, never been updated a single time. It's easy to forget about it. So a lot of vendors have started doing this, building in automatic updates, where the router will automatically reach out and download updates. But even when you do that, the router is normally waiting for some time when the network is idle, right? It usually like in the middle of the night, it'll reach out and it'll do that update. But if you're trying to use the router and all of a sudden it reboots for an update, you lose connectivity. So you've got to make a choice. Do you want the convenience of automatic where it updates itself? Or do you want to do it manually and then you have to remember every so often to log in and do the updates? Well, I find that I generally forget. So <laughs> if you want to be on the safe side, you can check off automatic and now it's going to periodically reach out, and if it finds an update, it'll automatically apply it, and then it'll reboot when it sees the network at its lowest utilization, or some of them allow you to set a time. You might actually see a field down here, and you can say, I wanna do it at 3 a.m. And so when you enable that setting, you then pick the time. This one doesn't, it just looks for idle time. Remember, all your traffic's going through the router, so it knows when the network is idle and when it isn't. It's got a pretty good idea of that, and it can uh, you know, make sure to, to do that accordingly. So, um, so for me, I could just choose that. I could also actually go and install this update. Now, I don't really know anything about this update. It's possible this update doesn't fix anything I care about. Uh, here in the United States, a lot of times we'll see these firmware updates and it'll say, um, adjusted the antenna for Canadian carrier bell or something like that, right? Uh, and it'll be some, some Canadian law or setting that is important if you're in Canada, not important if you're in the US. And somewhere, in Canada, there is a IT instructor who's delivering a, a, the same course and saying, 
you know, we get these updates in Canada, and half the time it's fixing something over in the U.S., right? So that, that happens. These routers are sold in more than one country. But just as often as that, it will be a security fix that everybody cares about. If I click to install it, it's just going to jump right in and try and do the install. If I want to learn more about that firmware update, that's where I need to go to the vendor's website. Remember back in part one, I talked about going and getting the manual. Well, here was the manual. I, I went to the Linksys support webpage and I pulled it up and here was the PDF. Right beside it is downloads slash firmware. And if I had chosen that, it would take me to a page where I could start to see the various versions of firmware that have come out. And there was a version 1.0, now we're on version 2.0. And here's the 2.0.2.188405 that I'm about to download. It actually came out May 15th, which is embarrassingly, that's like seven weeks ago uh, from when this was filmed. So, um, so this update's been out for a little while and it's got release notes. And I can look at those release notes to figure out what changed, right? So what, what is new in this update, right? So here it is uh, and it's telling me, um, do not install this on a version one router. Mine's a version two router, so I'm fine. Um, don't power cycle during the update. But then here it's telling me what it did. First, it added support for Winbond, Micron, and MXIC Flash. Okay, so that, that's talking about storage that you add to those USB ports. I'm not using that, so I don't really care about it. Modified the firmware update download directory. All right, so when it downloads firmware, it puts it somewhere different. Again, doesn't really help me. General bug fixes. That's a different story, right? I don't want bugs. Bugs make a router reboot or make it not send data. I would like that fixed. I'd, I'd like a better description than general bug fixes, but that'll do. If I look at some of the older ones, though, like the update that I'm running, I can see patched WPA2 crack vulnerabilities when operating in wireless bridge mode. That's a security vulnerability an attacker could use to get into the router. I definitely want to be running that update, right? Which, uh, let's see, is that what I'm running? I am running, let me just say no to this, and... I'm running 188405 and going back to the release notes, um, 188405 would be newer than this one. Uh, so I, I am patched for that, uh, but now there's an even newer one. Uh, oh, wait, sorry. I looked at the wrong number. Let me get back over here. So I'm currently running 182461. And so if I go back over here, try not to get motion sickness, 1824. Oh. I'm actually running this one from July of 2017. That means that my router right now is vulnerable to WPA2 crack attacks, all right? I've got a vulnerability. And I, as an end user, you don't have to be a security researcher. You don't have to dig through these release notes. All you have to do is make sure you hit that update button and it'll reach out there and do the update. So that's exactly what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go back here and I'm gonna turn on automatic updates so I don't have to worry about it again. And I'll hit that check for updates. It's gonna check and find that there's an update I'm going to go ahead and hit apply real quick just to make sure that it saves the automatic setting. And then I'm going to go ahead and click here to install and we're going to do it. Now, it warns me that it is going to reboot. It's going to download the firmware from Linksys, put it on the router and the reboot. This process usually takes a solid five, maybe even 10 minutes because the memory that's inside of the router doesn't write very fast. While it's doing this process, it's important not to interrupt power. They usually just have enough memory to store the operating system. So what it does is it deletes the old operating system to make room for the new one. If you lose power in between, it's already deleted the old operating system and now your router's non-functional. And so you'll have to call them. And they have a recovery procedure where you put the operating system on a USB key and you stick it on there, but it's a, it's a frustrating nightmare. It'll take a solid two hours to get that device back up and going. You don't want to do that if you can avoid it. But at this point, it's downloaded that firmware and now it's going to apply and it's telling me my router is rebooting. Don't mess with it right? This may take a few minutes. Please wait until the reboot is computed, so it, or completed. So at this point, I mean, you can, you can watch the front of the router and the lights will flash, but the lights don't really mean a whole lot while it's doing a firmware update because the full operating system isn't running. So you really just have to wait. And what I normally watch for is the, uh, the wireless networks, that if you watch for the wireless networks, when it actually reboots, they'll disappear. And then it does the update and when it boots back up, the wireless networks will reappear again. So you can kind of watch that for your status uh, and kind of see what's going on. See how Don's Wi-Fi fast and slow were showing up? And then I just got kicked out, right? Uh, so it kicked me out, and now I'm having to rescan for networks because I lost it. The router's rebooting. Well, when it's done, those networks will show back up again. Uh, actually, they're kind of showing up right now, but I am disconnected. So we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, they, they keep 
kind of disappearing. I, I just jumped over to the ITPO TV network because it's still up and running. Uh, my system did that automatically. So that process is going to happen. But when it's all said and done, my router has a new admin password. It's got a, a customized wireless network name and a different password. And I'm on the latest firmware. So I know my device is secure, safe, and now I can put it in production and know that I'm, I'm in good shape. All right, Don. Well, thank you again for helping us to think about more than just the idea of connectivity, but also the idea of security as well when we set up a wireless router. All these are important steps that we want to consider as we're setting this up, not only for our home networks, but if we're also going to be doing this for another company as well. These are things definitely that are, are on our mind to, to actually think of. All right, Don, last words on any type of uh, security or additional sure. configuration. Um, you know, a couple of things. Uh, the firmware actually, it actually just oh, finished nice. uh, while you were talking, so it, it went really fast. And so when I say, okay, things likely won't look any different, but I do see that I am running a current version of 2.02 now, so I know that I'm safe. Everything else here is, is pretty much the same, so nothing too crazy and, and special there, uh, but we're back up in business. The other thing is we really just scratched the tip of the iceberg. We did the minimum. What I just showed you is the minimum you should do on every wireless router that you configure, but there's a ton of other features in here, like the media server I mentioned earlier. Uh, I might want to customize my IP networks. I might want to set up uh, DMZs or port forwarding to allow like uh, an Xbox to communicate with Xbox Live. I might want to set up all sorts of crazy things like that, those features are available in your router. It just requires more advanced knowledge. So if you want to learn more about that, the Network Plus series is really the place we, we dive into that stuff uh, and get into it in depth. But what we've seen here, common settings everybody should be doing. All right, Don, thank you again. And thank you also for watching. Signing off for IT Pro TV, I'm your host, Ronnie Wong. And I'm Don Pazette. Stay tuned right here for more of your CompTIA IT Fundamentals show. Thank you for watching IT Pro TV.